Hey now, it's Dan Aberhart here, and welcome to the Growing the Future podcast, where we talk to folks who like to innovate, collaborate, and transform the agricultural industry. Thank you so much, dear listener, for joining us for Season 5, Episode 15. I have something very special for you today. When I first sat down with this individual a couple years ago, I was really amazed and impressed by, uh, first of all, the fact he'd take the time to sit down with me. But, you know, we went through a lot of his career, the calls that he's made, the research that he's done, uh, big macro moves, and uh, he's got a great track record of success. And this individual is going to share with us not only his background, but uh, how he views uh, agricultural land. He's a big player in that. I think you're going to know who I'm talking about uh, as we go on here. And also, what does the future hold? And that's really why I reached out to this individual because he was commenting on the internet about, you know, recession and depression and ESG, different kind of things like that that's going to affect us all going forward. So you're going to want to stick around to hear what this man has to say about uh, the state of planet Earth, no matter who you are and where you are and what you're doing. So I'm really looking forward to that. But before I introduce today's esteemed guest, I would like to remind you to check out the Aberhart family of companies online. Starting with AberhartFarms.com, where we grow food to feed the world in Langenberg, Saskatchewan. And we're actually neighbors with this individual to some of the tenants that he works with. Uh, SureGrowth.ca, where we offer precision agronomy consulting services. ConvergenceGrowth.com, where we accelerate solutions across food, health, and agriculture. And AberhartAgSolutions.ca, where we deliver one-of-a-kind fertility solutions of the future to your farm and you can get notified about our new episodes by signing up for our newsletter at growingthefuturepodcast.ca. My next guest is the pragmatic and hands-on founder and CEO of Angelic Land. There, I just gave it away. The largest landholder in Canada. I had to update the acres today from an article from two days ago that says he's got 231,428 acres owned and managed by himself and his team. He was an early entrepreneur, starting with home renovations in his teen years in Winnipeg's North End. He co-founded a masonry business, which evolved from residential projects to major commercial and public building efforts across Manitoba. He saw a gap in that industry, founded a company, eventually becoming Winnipeg's leading private industrial builder and developer. He even sold a highly desired building portfolio in 2007 in advance of the impending, uh, at the time, impending 2008-2009 market crash, which he foresaw, which we'll talk about. He launched Angelic Land in 2011 and spotted similar improvement opportunities in managing developed agricultural land in Saskatchewan. He actively participates in all facets of his business, from on-ground assistance with land improvements to meeting with producers directly. He sees himself as an advocate for Saskatchewan producers. I think this is a, a big element of what he does, and I hope that comes through on the podcast today. He wants to make Saskatchewan's producers uh, global leaders in food production. He is on our side. He is an ally. He, he wants to share his message. He collaborates with private industry and various governmental levels. Uh, he's focused on bringing value-added players to the Saskatchewan industry. And even over a decade into Angelic Land, Robert is on a mission driving across provinces and consistently working with his tenants to uplift and innovate the agricultural land that they farm. Today we want to talk about uh, his career, his, his, how he, he made his, his fortune, how he made his way in the world, how he does his research, uh, how he got to where he is today. Of course we want to talk about agricultural land and the business that he's built and how he goes about that. The one thing that he said he won't share is his formula for buying farmland. Uh, he's not going <laughs> to... I think I think that would be, uh, you know, a very nice um, little little uh, ditty to give away there. But, but that's the one thing we're not going to talk about today. But we also want to talk about his predictions for the future and uh, where things are going. And I think this is going to be extremely invaluable to you, dear listener. So welcome to the show, Robert Angelic. Well, thanks uh, for the invite. <laughs> it's a pleasure to join you. Oh, Robert, Robert, Robert. Well, this is going to be great. I'm so excited. But I, I want to start really at the beginning and unpack your here your history and your career to give the dear listener a feel for where you've come from. Take us back, your, your young man starting out uh, renovating uh, buildings in Winnipeg. How did that shape uh, your career? How did you get started? Take us on a journey here for for what you've done thus far here. Well, when we came to Canada, it was 1958. 
uh, dad, uh, within, I don't know, six months or so, he bought a house that needed renovations. So from the time uh, uh, I was, uh, what, thir 12, 13 yet and then, uh, 12, uh, and uh, I uh, helped with the renovations, demolishing a certain, like, walls and things to put on the drywall, uh, digging basements, uh, you know, and uh, so on. So I got uh, to know construction pretty good right from the young age. And where did you guys uh, come from, Robert? Where, where, where did well, you guys originate from? from? Croatia. Uh, we went over the border. Uh, we were snuck over the border by uh, uh, some uh, Bosnian guys. Uh, we got into Austria. Well, anyway, we we were stuck like a, in a movie <laughs> type where uh, the guy had a hay wagon and we were and he had a little box in there where we had to crawl into. So wow. it was under the pretext that he was uh, uh, taking hay to the animals and so on uh, on the road. And then when he got to a certain spot uh, on the uh, uh, Bosnia along the border. Then he he told us, "Well, you have to cross that stream. It's a, just a small stream, and then get into the bush, into the forest, and then just continue straight. And then you'll see the building on the other side, and that'll be Austria." Meanwhile, when they dropped us off, that it was a late, well, getting evening, uh, almost uh, dark. Uh, it started raining, and uh, yeah, that stream wasn't quite as little as he <laughs> said it was. So we, uh, we got all wet and it was three, four feet deep and you know, rocks and so on in it. So we fell into it. And anyway, and, uh, meanwhile, it was raining all along. Uh, then my mom heard the dogs and uh, uh, barking and everything. And in Europe, you know, they're pretty vicious. They're not uh, your mild uh, lab dogs <laughs> so she was worried about uh, it being a farm and then uh, lose dogs and so on and then in the distance you could hear gunshots like uh, border guards would fire every once in a while and so on they were armed and uh, it was they would shoot uh, anybody trying to uh, get over the border i wonder is that where some of your work ethic comes from your worldview i mean that's a pretty significant event in anybody's life and uh you certainly came from scarcity i guess because you're hanging by a thread there <laughs> in terms of survival at one point. well we spent the night in the forest again mom was afraid to go there at night uh and it was raining uh very heavy rain uh, and all all night long you could hear the dogs barking uh, and they were border guard dogs actually uh and uh, you could hear them uh, firing gunshots every once in a while. They were just automatic weapons. You could hear the drrr go off like every once in a while. And then uh, next day uh, morning, actually, mom thought of turning around, going back, because she thought she was being set up. Uh, and uh, like they, they could rob you on the other side or whatever. Anyway, uh, as it turns out, she decided to go, go with us uh, it was uh, me uh, and uh, my uh, sister and my uh, uh, youngest brother, who was only a baby at that time. When Mom was uh, uh, had him in his arm, in her arms. Unbelievable. Anyway, we what, was, what was that all about? What was the history there? What 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 was the conflict well, that about? Was crossing the border, like uh, mm. we were. Uh, Dad arranged. Dad went ahead of me, and he arranged. Uh, for people to take, uh, for mom to travel from uh, Slavonia, where, where we're at, to that location, and then they were to take us and guide us across the border into hmm. Austria. Hmm. Well, you must sure. be thankful to uh, be in uh, Canada. Start. Uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's fascinating. Anyway, so... that's the start, and then we got into mm -hmm. Canada in 1958. Uh, Dad, uh, within six months, I was so I said, like I said, he bought a, a house that uh, was uh, being partially renovated. The guy had run out of money and he had to sell, and Dad bought it, and we we continued working on it. And uh, 
and got it done and uh, moved on to other houses. Uh, like throughout my uh, childhood, like we were moving around sometimes every three, four months, six months, a year for sure. We, we, we we'd uh, renovate, uh, sell, move on to another one. All the time living in the, in the house and renovating. And then uh, when I was 17, I bought my own house, first house. I was still in high school uh, for renovation and so on. Uh, I renovated that, sold it, and then moved on. And uh, in between, and then uh, all the time uh, in between the full time job was masonry, doing house fronts, and then and so on at first, and then uh, and then uh, moving into. Uh, uh, some subcontracts like uh, doing uh, warehouses, apartment blocks, schools, and uh, we did a lot of schools uh, throughout uh, uh, rural Man Manitoba. And then moving into the uh, high-end projects like hydro projects, converter stations, and uh, uh, like uh, Dorsey, uh, the main hydro projects uh, up north. And I wonder, then, uh, Robert, at what point in, at what point did you start doing research around this? Like at 17, you bought your first house, and then obviously at some point you transitioned into commercial. But when did you start? When did you start doing this research that led you to all these different industries? Well, it was all a learning curve to begin with. Like when you're doing these projects, uh, hydro projects, schools, uh, uh, churches, uh, all kinds of buildings, you get to see all the. the uh, details of different architects, engineers, and so on. So you see wh what works the best, ultimately. And then I started incorporating uh, all that into my own buildings once we started warehouses. So it yeah. was all a learning curve. Uh, at first, it wasn't all that uh, much research into it other than uh, just uh, taking all those uh, d details different details of construction and then incorporating them into our buildings, into our own buildings that I thought we could do better. Yeah. Uh, so when we started doing buildings, of course, they, would, they started with small buildings. That was way back in the 70s. Well, we started with one and a half, one and a half thousand, two thousand small, just small warehouse uh, office buildings and Inkster Industrial Park and so on. And then moved to larger ones, and uh, eventually uh, I was in partners with my dad at that time. And when my brother started to come in, at that time we split up. Dad and I split up, and, uh, and then dad and uh, my brother went together. I see. That was in uh, 87. I went uh, completely on my own doing industrial buildings. Yeah. At that time, 87... A 88, 99, uh, I was doing uh, buildings on my own. And then in 89 or so, uh, the 90s recession, I seen that coming. Uh, so I got ready with some cash, sold some uh, warehouses and got ready with some cash to uh, tie me over and uh, in case there's vacancies and so on, so I could still make mortgage payments. Uh, like I seen the recession coming about a year before it actually hit. Uh, How did you was, see uh, that, Robert? Not, I mean, this is one of the interesting things times, about you. That yeah, times, like you have tenants, you know, that are in all aspects of business. That at that time we had the smaller tenants, but they were still manufacturing, uh, uh, warehousing, uh, distribution, and so on. And you could you talk to them every day, just much like I do to the tenants today in uh, farmland. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's interesting because uh, that's a big element of what you do is staying in touch with the folks you're working with, and that gives you a good feel for the markets, I guess. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, about a year before that, like I said, I got ready with uh, sub sales, and I got into a cash position. And I remember going to. Uh, for uh, for breakfast and uh, with a competitor and he knew I got ready and everything and uh, that morning a whole bunch of good economic news came out 
And uh, he knew, like I said, that I that uh, I got ready for a recession, and he says to me, all dressed up and no place to go. And uh, within eight months, they had to file bankruptcy because that wow. recession really yeah. hit, and uh, that was the time of the high interest rates and so on. So that's an anyway, irrational exuberance at the top, I guess, eh? Well, at that time, uh, it was uh, different. I think uh, Wolf. Paul Volcker was uh, the uh, Fed chair, and uh, he increased the rates to very high. Like, uh, I think uh, we were dealing with 21% interest rates. Nothing like the 7% today, excuse me. No worries. Yeah, I was wondering a little bit about the environment and and the things that led up to that and, and how you saw that. Well, it was tough. Like, you know, it's hard to make a 20 plus percent uh, profit. I don't think too many companies uh, make that. So so there was a shortfall. Even if your buildings were full, uh, you still had to, unless uh, depends on your mortgages and their expiry dates and so on. Uh, if you had to renew during that time and uh, but invariably, like you build warehouses throughout every year, you do some. And uh, so some would expire at any one time and uh, the mortgages would expire and you'd have to renew at the higher interest rates, much like right now. Right. Anyway, so that got us to uh, uh, 1990s and uh, then uh, 2000, that was another downturn. So I went through about three different recessions. Uh, and then uh, I thought that 2008, like the subprime issue, I knew that, that this was going to hit the fan. And uh, in 2006, I got ready to uh, sell something I've been working my whole life in. Uh, warehouse and get right out. Construction and get right out completely. The idea that was, was one of the biggest sales of commercial real estate in the history of Canada at the time, or maybe, well, maybe still that, is. No, actually in Manitoba. I don't know about Canada. Manitoba. Okay, well, yeah. we're getting, yeah, we don't want to get carried away here, but. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're correct. That was, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was, I think, 200 plus million. Yeah, not a bad anyway, start. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, during that time, uh, the idea was to sell and then sit back and wait until uh, I thought the recession was going to be a lot worse than it turned out. Uh, and I thought uh, the market would fall a lot lower. It was rescued by, I think, Hank Paulson at that time engineered the whole thing of uh, where the uh, banking uh, uh, bank failures uh, saved the banks and so on. Uh, so... Uh, the idea was to sell at that time, move, move us along, wait a year or two until uh, uh, warehouse office prices fell to where I can pick the new ones up at uh, 50, 60 cents on a dollar. So that's the reason I moved to Alberta because I, I had a non compete clause in. Uh, Manitoba, so I couldn't do it in Manitoba. So then I was going to start buying in Alberta, Calgary, Edmonton, and so on, warehouse office market. Uh, the market didn't quite fall as far as the, uh, I thought it would. It fell like by 30% or so, but not, not by uh, 50% what I was anticipating anyway. In between, uh, I was trading commodities, uh, oil, uh, uh, gold. Uh, I bought into uh, even Viterra just before it sold and so on. Uh, <laughs> and then rare earth metals uh, was a very good uh, investment for me. I was amongst the very first in rare earth metals at that time, because at that time, China controlled about uh, 98% of the world's rare earth metals. I think today mm -hmm. they, it's a little bit less than control, but 94%, but they still uh, uh, have uh, major control of the rare earth metals in the world. 
And, uh, so you, you saw the anything. coming advent of all of the need for rare earth metals right from, you know, phones and electric cars. You, you had a feel for that? Yes. Well, the, the lot more to it than the, just the green uh, uh, movement uh, re- needing uh, rare earth metals. That's uh, even the U.S. smart bombs and uh, all their defense equipment needs uh, 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 rare earth metals and so on. So uh, hmm. I kind of thought, well, the uh, U.S. is not going to depend on China for uh, su- to supply rare earth metals for their for uh, their own uh, home security, homeland security. So I thought they'd uh, go into it and uh, start developing it on their own more so than the, they've done. But they did go get into it eventually, and I sold out. Well, originally I couldn't buy anything in North America. Canada or U.S., I had to go to the Australian markets and open a, an account there and deal with the, their dollars and so on and exchange. But I did get into it in pretty heavy fashion. One thing that you said I was really fascinated by, Robert, you said that the market in, in commercial real estate dropped 30%. You you moved to Alberta. You're going to pick up you know some some new properties at at you know half half price and never got to half price but what kind of patience does it take to not buy at 30% drop because you think it's a 50% drop like that takes a lot of discipline and patience does it not well it does well you you need discipline no matter what business you're in mm-hmm. like uh even right now i am uh, anticipating uh, this recession slash depression and uh now you know you could be I could be buying a lot more farmland, but I'm sitting on some uh, cash like a reserve just in case uh, things do turn to, turn uh, <laughs> down a little. So you can uh, you don't have the rental income much too much the same like an industrial or commercial real estate that that I did. It takes years, especially yeah. like sometimes uh, I see it coming. Year two, well, this one I've seen three years. I've been anticipating the downturn here for today's uh, downturn. Well, let's let's get into that a little bit later. Uh, I, you know, I want to stick with the uh, history here. What kind of research led to you becoming the largest landowner in Canada? What was the foundational work you did to realize this was a great market well, to be in? After the being in. Uh, commodities and uh, uh, other uh, stocks and so on. I kind of looked at it and I thought, well, geez, I can't leave this to the children and grandchildren. This is so hands-on. You have to be there every day and manip- and ma- manipulate, maneuver it and so on, position it correctly. So then I thought, well, what's there that Canada has that the, uh, the rest of the world needs and China can't duplicate uh, at home and so on. Because uh, when I was in, of course, uh, industrial real estate, I've seen my manufacturers going bankrupt one after another because China was beating them out and so on. So I figured no matter who wins the economic race, whether it be uh, the high tech uh, technology, the chips, the whatever manufacturing, finished goods, and so on. Uh, it could be China, could be India, could be uh, South Korea, whichever one. What do they need that Canada has, but that they can't duplicate easily? And mm-hmm. the answer, of course, is agriculture products, <laughs> food and water. Uh, so then that's the reason I got into farmland. When all did all you along, first buy? Told, when did you? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was wondering when you got started in, in agriculture and uh, maybe how much research you did before buying your first piece of oh, land. I did a lot of research. I did uh, research with climate change, uh, uh, all kinds of different variables and uh, so on, uh, and uh, which province had the uh, best uh, priced land. Uh, I'm talking equal production land. So if I can produce 50 bushels per acre, in Manitoba, 50 in Saskatchewan, 50 in Alberta. How do these prices compare? Mm. When I looked at it, Saskatchewan stood out. 
I, at that right. time, I didn't know why until I did more research. But uh, the reason, of course, was that the policies of the provincial government of having uh, uh, of uh, only uh, Saskatchewan resident being able to buy Saskatchewan farmland. Right. So that was changed about five years before I got into it, or a little bit more, maybe. Uh, and uh, so there wasn't enough capital coming in to really keep up with the prices of Manitoba and Alberta. In my right. view, uh, like at that time, uh, Manitoba was two, three times the price of Saskatchewan. Well, let's say two times on the average. And uh, Alberta was three, four times. Yeah. And now it's narrowed down. But uh, all the all time, uh, Saskatchewan has been going up, but so have the other provinces. So the, but the, uh, Saskatchewan has been going a little bit more, as indicated by two, just a couple of the, uh, days ago, a week ago, uh, uh, survey, a survey by FCC, mm-hmm. where uh, prices increased uh, 11 point some percent in the last six months, and mm-hmm. the other provinces came up too, but not quite as much. So in other yep. words, the gap is narrowing. So now I'm able to buy back in Manitoba as well. Well, not Alberta as much, uh, a little bit in Manitoba. You still have to do your homework and uh, uh, check the prices and you have to buy uh, at a reasonable price, which is pretty hard right now. There's not many listings. Uh, this is uh, almost, uh, this is the lowest by far, lowest amount of listings since I got into it in 2010. Yeah, and that's driving the price as well as this. There's no supply right now. Yes. Yeah. So you developed a formula to get into into farmland. Did you have an idea that it might reach the scale that that you reached today? I mean, did you have any plan or foresight on that? Well, I uh, went to my initial assumption was that Saskatchewan farmland again equal production. In all three provinces would have to, that same land in Saskatchewan would have to reach uh, Manitoba price and Alberta price, so I knew it had a long way to go. Yeah. Okay, so, but the, the fact that it would go to this price, uh, I didn't think it as fast. I knew it would go up to it, but uh, not this fast. A little faster. Than so can you did. explain the differences between the provinces? Like you said that it was five years before you got into the market in Saskatchewan that foreign investors were allowed. What were the differences between Saskatchewan and, and Alberta and Manitoba? Well, the Manitoba farmland at that price was about uh, two two to three times more expensive. Yeah. So uh, the, when I got in, uh, I was buying between, let's say, $400 an acre to $600 an acre. And, uh, well, uh, that was a start. Uh, and of course, the other two provinces were much higher. Yeah. And uh, then eventually uh, it started going up. I think I start, stopped buying it around uh, or uh, adding uh, considerable amounts. And most of them, uh, my uh, land purchases happened within the first four or five years. And what years were those? 2010? 2010 to 2015. Well, I always and, uh, wondered about that because back home, like you, you're familiar with our, you're familiar with our area there, Robert. I always wonder about that back home because we could produce almost as much as in, you know any any farm in, in Manitoba in a lot of places, but our land was a fraction of the price. I always wondered why that was. Well, it was because of the lack of capital coming into Saskatchewan, and uh, the neighbors knew it's. Uh, you have to be a Saskatchewan resident to buy it, so either the neighbor had to buy it or somebody else uh, uh, nearby, and because uh, other capital couldn't come in to compete uh, uh, against it. And when yeah, you have a lot of I... capital coming in, that's the answer. Yeah. Agricultural land or uh, production doesn't know no boundaries. Just because the Manitoba's on the other side. That doesn't mean it'll produce twice as much or anything, or the land should be twice the price. Yeah. 
I remember around 2000 when I started selling John Deere sprayers, there was land that was going fallow in southeastern Saskatchewan. No one wanted to rent it. No one wanted to farm it. It was unbelievable. And now that land is worth a lot. Yes, there were problems uh, when, like that. And when I talked to my tenants uh, that have been in it uh, all their whole life, they tell me of times where they could pick up uh, farmland, uh, Saskatchewan farmland, to rent for the price of taxes. Yep. You know, things have changed. Yep. On that note about investors uh, getting into agricultural farmland, I, I seen something here on the internet. So you often talk with different producers and you're not afraid to speak your mind. I really like that about you. But I recognize that your position is somewhat uh, controversial. You you posted about the 17% increase in, in farmland values in Saskatchewan. And you explained that, um, you know, uh, even though that's a seems like a really big exorbitant number it's still low the values in saskatchewan are still low relative to other places and in the comments here there was a producer that uh, made a comment that i think is indicative of uh, how a lot of producers look at you and your company and and investors coming in on farmland and the producer said our farmland would be much more f affordable had investors not been let in and i think that's a perception of a lot of folks, how do you address that with with your with your company and your activities? Well, I look at it uh, just like when I was in the stock market. If you own, like, uh, investors own about two point five, let's say three percent of total farmland. Three percent does not sway any market, whether it be the stock market, farmland market, or any market. Uh, it's a it's rounding off error. Uh, so I don't agree with that. And uh, I can uh, pay for farmland only what my rents are. When the rents were $60, you put in a cap rate of 3%, I can only pay X amount on that. A producer can make a lot more money, of course, Depends on the price of the commodities, and he can pay a lot more. So I, I've been outbid by the producer all the time. Uh, yeah, you once explained to me that you're at a net disadvantage to anybody who can farm the land because of your position, and that you're just buying undervalued assets, and that also that you have a really good relationship with your tenants, and and you work with them to for all parties to win and make money and, and help develop the land. Like you buy a lot of land and then develop it similar to what you did in your commercial real estate career. Well, uh, that's another aspect of it, but just the pure uh, buying power, I do not have the buying power that a producer has because of being limited by the rents. And rents... In all markets, doesn't matter whether it's commercial real estate or farmland, always lag the market sale price or current replacement of commercial real estate. Uh, if I built a building today, that building will not cash flow for five years. If another way, so if I buy land today, I'll dilute, dilute my cap rate, but it uh, it won't cash flow uh, until the rents catch up in about. Uh, five years or so, three to five years, three years minimum, five years normally. And that's true, well, it, commercial real estate or farmland. When you look at uh, the overall numbers, 231,000 seems like a huge farm or a lot of land to own. But if if it's, uh, you know, two or 3% is owned by investors, there's 64 million arable acres in Western Canada, thereabouts, or something like that. I mean, you're 0 0.003 percent of of the market and yet you're quite visible and i think for folks that are worried about investors driving up the price of land so that their their offspring can't farm you, you're not exactly moving the needle are you nowhere near to uh again again uh price of farmland is uh, only one component of it the other one is the inputs the equipment and everything else associated with it. 
So uh, why doesn't anybody address the price of every uh, combine or every major piece of equipment being a uh, million dollars plus? Okay, and then look at your inputs. You know, so uh, uh, land it actually uh, investors should be able to play a good key role in uh, like with the rents and so on. So let's say a full line of equipment, you know, we'll do between seven to a thousand acres per year. Uh, depends if you want to run it around the clock or whatever. But uh, if you're farming, let's say 4,000 acres and you have a line of equipment, you're underutilizing that equipment. So you could rent a uh, 3,000 acres from me and fully utilize that equipment, your payments are the same. Doesn't matter whether you're farming that uh, 7,000 or the 4,000. Is it that you don't have a lot of competitors in the agricultural investment sphere because the real rates of return aren't as high as, say, something like being John Deere, who can make 20, 30, 40% in a really good year and people are paying well, uh, a million bucks for the X9? Investors, uh, uh, like uh, with all capital, they look at where's their best returns. And uh, farmland right now, if you go according to today's price, three, four thousand dollars per acre, let's say uh, kind of average, uh, you'd be looking at a cap rate anywhere from zero, even negative, up to uh, you, you, very hard to achieve three percent. Right. Okay. So. If you look at your uh, commercial real estate returns, cap rates, uh, most of my uh, adult life has been between 10 and 20% return because we did our own construction and uh, design and uh, leasing and, uh, and everything else. So we had a little bit higher cap rate, return rate than than, uh, let's say, the institutional investors in commercial real estate. So why would uh, somebody go from that to, to uh, farmland? Farmland uh, normally correlates close to gold when it comes to recessions and so on, uh, uh, and inflation. So uh, it is, uh, but then so does all real estate uh, play a part. Right now, it's a little bit different problem than what's been normal with commercial real estate. We could get into that later, but there are some big problems with commercial real estate. Yeah, I want to talk about that, but let's talk about the nuts and bolts of your agricultural farmland business. And I, I went on your website there, and it looks like you got a fantastic team of people helping you out, obviously, and you, you tell me that you're working 14-7, and I've, I've, I've read that you're on the road half the time, talking to producers, looking at crops. How do you work with your tenants to really make that, you know, in a, in a kind of a low rate of return environment, how do you work with your tenants to to keep everybody happy, to make land improvements, you know, to, to be a, a good community steward? Um, how does it look working with tenants? Well, it's great. I love working with them. Especially today, like uh, the business-minded individuals. And when I first got into it, uh, I was a little surprised as to uh, how the business uh, end of uh, agriculture was lacking. Okay, so they were good producers. They could produce the product, grow the product. But they were very poor in marketing and getting a top dollar for that product. Uh, today, I think uh, uh, today's producers, especially uh, the more, much more progressive ones, they're looking at uh, uh, hedging and uh, doing all kinds of different things that I'm used to with in other fields, commercial real estate and everything else that I didn't see before in agriculture. But uh, today's uh, upcoming uh, entrepreneurs, they're very good at it. And I'm really, I love working with them now. The, the, the young guys, uh, they're mostly 40 and under, you know, like, uh, and uh, they're growing their business. They're uh, 
uh, doing all the right, making all the right moves, and uh, there's a large numbers of them. Yeah. So if I'm a young producer looking to get into farming, uh, is that something that you help facilitate with capital and and mentorship and and partnership? Well, we try that, but it didn't doesn't really work that well. Like uh, you uh, entrepreneurs, they really don't need any help. Like I don't care what you, know, you don't want to throw hurdles in front of them, but given a half chance, they'll succeed. Maybe not the first time, but but they they will succeed. <laughs> uh, so I have all the confidence that you know, that uh, the right ones will succeed. You you could ask another question, like why is farming so different? Okay, like it took me a lifetime to get into industrial. Uh, commercial real estate why why can't a young kid go into commercial real estate buy a hundred thousand square foot building today that building is most likely about uh, 30 million uh or it's, well it's about two hundred thousand per square foot or i mean two two hundred dollars per square foot sorry uh so so that'd be about 20 million so you know why can't they participate in that? Right. You know why is farmland farming so different? Yeah. Uh, with the, they have to put in their time, just like I put in my time. I started from zero. Actually, when I started, I was a, a bricklayer's like labor, brickling labor. Uh, that's as low as you can go on the totem pole. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Been mixing mortar by hand and everything, and doing house fronts and so on, which is what my dad and, uh, and a whole bunch of uh, his uh, buddies did. Uh, and uh, we were working together. And yeah. Anyway, so is, is, yeah. Go ahead. But if there's determination and if the individuals want to get into it, they definitely can get into it. Because uh, Saskatchewan still has some of the lowest priced farmland in the world. And that, that includes a lot of developing countries. Like Philippines has higher priced land than, than us, uh, agricultural land. If you look at land in the U.S., uh, I've just seen some records being broken at 35,000 or so an acre. So you don't have to go to 35,000, but let's say 10 to 15,000. How do those guys do it? Yeah. Where did you find these sweet spots geographically for for farmland that fit your very strict formula? Well, geographically, uh, like I did a lot of research on the climate change. And uh, at one time, uh, I had about quite a bit of land uh, about throughout the province, a lot in the southwest. Uh, then I sold uh, about eight years or nine years ago, I sold in the southwest about 25,000 acres, anticipating the droughts and so on, because I studied the Gleisberg cycles and all these different solar cycles that are at work. And, uh, well, we've been in drought now, what, seven years now in the southwest? <laughs> so That's I crazy. Feel... That's Chris, crazy that you would have looked at the big picture like that. So what what are you see when it comes to climate change? I mean, it's easy to sum it up and be you know far right or far left on the spectrum. Um, where do you stand on on what uh, is getting labeled as climate change? That the world is you know going to be on fire here, and we're going to be fire and floods, and essentially the end of the world. How do you see it? Well, I've been studying all those cycles, different cycles, and then there there's five, ten year. It, it, 90 year, like at Gleisberg's 90, solar cycles 11 years apart. Uh, and then they go into hundreds of years and some into the thousands of years, but we won't worry about the thousand year ones because we won't <laughs> see them. But the thousand years ones are the, the ice ages and so on, 12,000 or 10, whatever. Uh, so I studied the shorter ones and I see them taking effect like at one, when I started buying down south, below, uh, around the Cinnaboy area, let's say, Cinnaboy, Saskatchewan, and they used to grow canola, used to get 30, 35 bushels per acre, some 40. 
And I've seen that dwindling being uh, knocked down further and further, and uh, they're now they're 15, 20 if they're lucky, and so on. So canola, canola is a cooler weather loving plant, so it's telling you that too much heat and so on. So uh, areas like Yorkton and so on, they can get their 50, 60 bushels. So uh, I got ready for that and bought a lot more. Out, like when I sold the Southwest, I bought a lot around Yorkton and the, let's say east of Regina. So uh, whether the other ones will get uh, uh, rains again, uh, the other ones being the west, Yes, they will eventually, but uh, not this year. Next year, I see the, the El Nino taking effect. And El Nino is usually a little drier, especially for uh, our competitors like Australia, because your currents change. They go from, uh, normally the current is going uh, from east to west, taking all the moisture and everything uh, putting it, dumping it on Australia, the monsoons in India, and so on. Uh, so, but then not, but once El Nino kicks in, then the currents change from west to east. Th th those rains aren't available anymore. So they, so Australia might go into a drought in the 23, 24, and so will India, and so on. So, uh, they're all occurring as we speak. And uh, as we speak, like right now, Saskatchewan, for example, has 30 more frost-free days than they had 50 years ago. And that's fact. Okay, so so when your father and gra your grandfather farmed and so on, they had 30 days to work with. That's virtually, you, that could be your season, right? Uh, like... Uh, uh, if you take the rains out and so on, uh, when you're during your seeding, you, you have a very small window. What it could be two weeks, three weeks if you're lucky, and so on. So uh, that extends the season quite a bit. So I was reading. What, I was reading, Robert, that uh, <clears throat> climate change. Some model of climate change models of climate change showed that there was going to be four times as much arable land in Canada. But you didn't you didn't agree with that assessment. However, you have been moving somewhat north. Absolutely not, because I did a lot of research on that again too. Uh, there's very few beneficiaries, if you could call them, uh, beneficiaries of climate change, and uh, you can attribute it to whatever you like, whether it's uh, a man-made activity that's causing it, or uh, it's uh, just uh, cycles. And so on. I see a lot more uh, attributed to the cycles. Uh, yeah, yeah, man has uh, done damage, but uh, I think the cycles are uh, much uh, carry much more weight. Anyway, uh, where we were going with that? Uh, uh, well, I wonder though, isn't that an important point, Robert? Because it seems like so much. I mean, we'll get into it, but there's so much policy, and people are so concerned about the state of climate change, isn't it important whether that's a natural cycle or it's actually due to man-made activity? Isn't that an important distinction for our lives? It is, but you can't convince other people to, to look at science. I look at science. And what is science? Is? Scientists that are studying, spend their whole life studying uh, uh, tree rings and everything else to tell, show you the, the rainfall uh, hundreds of years ago and uh, studying the ice fields and so on. Uh, they can tell you, but somehow we seem to be ignoring the science and giving so, it a, and uh, giving a lot more weight to uh, I don't know what you'd want to call it, but uh, rhetoric. Yeah, and yeah. so on. I wonder, can you tell us a little bit more about the science then of this Gleisberg cycle and uh, what that looks like? Well, the Gleisberg cycles are every 87.8, uh, that's around around 90 years. And they encompass about eight uh, solar cycles. Solar cycle is 11 years. Solar cycle is when the sun, North Pole reverses and becomes South Pole, and the uh, sun flare activity and so on acts up. And uh, But they peak during the 
uh, peak of the Gleisberg cycle, uh, uh, let's say 90 years apart. And uh, man, I don't know if I want to kind of get into it too much because uh, it is a little uh, scary as to the last uh, Gleisberg cycle was during the 30, uh, dirty 30s. Yeah, that tells you uh, their effect. So they are very uh, solar flares, and they can be weaker, stronger, and so on. They're not; uh, it's not fixed. But uh, we're at almost a peak right now, which of course tells you that uh, the last seven-year drought, and uh, it's not just pure drought. It could be rain uh, floods in other areas, and so on. They have different effects, different areas, of course. Of the world, yeah, I find it interesting too uh, where we are historically. I mean, you l- listen to Peter Z- Zihan. We're at the end of a 70, 80 year cycle since World War II, where we're seeing demographics and deglobalization having a huge impact on all of our lives right now. Does that tie in, or is that just coincidence that that we're sort of in that that kind of cycle? <laughs> I don't think, I don't know if demographics have anything to do with it, if that's what he's talking about. Not uh, mm-hmm. not in those cycles, like I never looked at it from that point of view. But we, uh, dem- demographically speaking, uh, we are kind of reversing that uh, n- that normal py- pyramid that would go from uh, the youngest, uh, biggest uh, portion of the population, then uh, the older less and less. Now it's kind of being... Uh, uh, like seniors uh, are a lot more of the uh, higher number of the population. Yeah. How how do you see um, Canada? You're talking about uh, advocating for Saskatchewan producers, trying to be a global leader. Where do you see uh, Western Canadian agriculture fitting in globally versus what's going to be happening uh, in other countries going forward here? Well, getting back to uh, your, your original question, I didn't quite answer it. Uh, you, we, we talked about that uh, four times more land or whatever yeah. their number was. Uh, I, Canada is one of the beneficiaries, USSR, or not USSR, uh, Soviet Republic. The uh, Russia. Russia, yeah, Russia. Russia is another one and some of the other northern tier countries, possibly. The problem with Canada, uh, yes, uh, Ontario will get more heat units further north, uh, but what you what do you have? You have the Canadian Shield there. Is that arable land? No. Uh, then you have Manitoba. Manitoba is more, a lot of gravel, of boulders, uh, acidic soil, pH 4. 4.5 pH. Uh, so that that's not uh, really uh, going to open up much land. Saskatchewan uh, uh, has the biggest, big potential, along with northern Alberta. But you're still dealing with uh, acidic soils, uh, uh, boreal forest, and so on. Right. There's like uh, physical really limitations to how much farmland yeah. can open up. Well, uh, do you have the soil for it uh, yeah. that can produce, uh, that can grow plants, can grow yeah. crops? Yeah. So you you say that your buying has slowed down. Are there still opportunities? Are you still advancing? Are you holding? Are you thinking about going to cash? Well, okay, uh, when you talk cap rates, uh, going back a little, because uh, just so people don't think, well, you are got a 2% cap, how do you make more mortgage payment? When you when I bought, it's five, six hundred, seven hundred dollars $700 an acre. That land is getting the same rent today as if you buy it at 3500 an acre. So my cap rate goes up because of time. Just like that five-year uh, period that I was talking about with building, whether it be buildings or farmland, where it starts cash flowing after, because the rents go up, and your cost base stays the same, 
your cap rate increases. Yeah. So so uh, that's uh, one aspect of, of uh, investing in farmland. If uh, you, you put in, if uh, a certain amount of time goes by, your cap rates will increase as your uh, rents increase uh, and yep. so on. Uh, what was your question again? Sorry. Well, I was just curious, you know, whether, you know, you said that there was a time when you when you acquired a lot of farmland uh, that's since slowed down. Yes, and now you're talking about some big changes in the fundamentals of the of the money system and you know uh, commercial real estate and stuff, which we'll get into. But what is your plan? Are you continuing to buy where there's sweet spots, or are you looking at uh, slowing down, or even maybe getting out? You, you know? Oh, absolutely not getting out. No, yeah, no, that doesn't even enter the picture. Uh, what I'm looking at is uh, uh, getting through the slower period uh i've identified already that uh commercial real estate is going to take there's going to be a bloodbath nothing like what we've seen in the past this is going to be the real bad for commercial real estate worldwide whether it be china australia us doesn't matter canada everybody uh, once you have to refinance at these new rates, and that, that it's slow. There's a lag effect between all that, everything that's happened. Uh, like uh, with uh, increase uh, with Powell, uh, central banks increasing the uh, mortgage, uh, I mean the rates, uh, interest rates, and so on. And uh, there's a lag effect of about a year to a year and a half to two years. So we're actually just starting to feel the initial rate increases. We're starting to see the rate increases. Yes, because of the lag effect. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, industries that uh, are affected fairly quickly, like let's say the uh, housing industry. How, because... Uh, if you want to buy a new house, you 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 have to refinance today, or not refinance. You have to put a mortgage on it today at current rate. But uh, let's say, uh, like in my industry, if I my mortgage doesn't expire for another three years, I don't have no no effect of uh, today's interest rates other than what I buy today. If uh, if I want to finance at today's prices, and that's what keeps me from. Uh, Buying and adding land, it has to be a fairly good deal for me to uh, buy it, and uh, I have to see a lot of upside uh, in order for to go out and take that risk. So, I'm, so your I'm, plan uh, is more or less to hold until <laughs> you see this next cycle move through. Until uh, I see the next cycle move through, but uh, my. Uh, uh, what I see for the future is uh, there will the the rise in the interest rates today will will continue and maybe stay for uh, I don't know another six months to a year and then the, they'll uh, plateau. We're gonna uh, go into that recession that I talked about maybe sooner than uh, the six months even, and then uh, Fed will. Uh, start lowering interest rates back to possibly back to whatever number, uh, zero even. It depends on how bad the recession depression is that I'm uh, calling for, but I think it's coming. And then at that point, you refinance again and uh, uh, because the rates should be the lowest. See, I even go to the point and like do enough research and everything else. I time my mortgage uh, term to the U.S. elections because during the uh, prior and during the election, they're going to put a lot of pressure on the Fed to lower rates, of course. What are the conditions that 
have led us to this this uh, impending uh, bloodbath of of commercial real estate and recession and depression that you're talking about? Well, the conditions are the worst in all the past recessions that I've ever seen. Okay, I went through three, four recessions. Depends what you how you want to term them. They define recessions and so on. This one has about 20, 30 moving components that need to be fixed that, in my view, I don't think are even fixable. So you need a whole new realignment, economic realignment of everything. From the supply chain of uh, commodities to the moving of those commodities being refined and uh, uh going into uh, uh, manufactured goods and ultimately finished goods and so on, everything has to be, uh, is changing. We're no longer in a global world economy. And that, has, that, that is a major structural change that didn't affect other res past recessions. Past recessions had three, four, five, maybe economic components that went wrong that had to be corrected. This one's 20, 30, maybe 50 different components. Depends how you want to break them down to what into what categories. Some cannot isn't, be fixed. Uh, isn't, uh, isn't Donald Trump going to fix everything in 2024, Robert, when he gets yeah. back in? Nobody can fix it. Because uh, this is uh, something structural, something very different that uh, uh, that uh, isn't fixable with uh, anyone. You can fix one component, but there's still 20, 30, 50 others that are uh, unfixable. So if you're an agricultural producer in Western Canada right now listening to this, as much of our audience is, what should they be doing? What should they expect? Well, food is a is a, an exception to this whole thing. Agriculture as a whole, yes. Uh, uh, if we go into these this recession depression that I'm anticipating, uh, food uh, demand may go down. But the way I see climate change, and all my research shows that uh, different countries will be affected in different ways through, doesn't matter what, whether it be droughts, floods, and all kinds of different uh, things that, uh, that keeps them from uh, getting the yields that they did in the past. So let, let's say the demand goes down by 10% and that supply goes down by 20%, you're still in a deficit position. Yeah, the demand is still outstripping the supply. And that's what I see going forward. And that's where agriculture will then, uh, will, uh, it will be hurt. It will be set back a little, but it won't be nowhere near to what the rest of the world economies will be set back. And as, again, it doesn't matter whether it's commercial real estate or whatever you want to name. Do you see agriculture being able to keep up with, with demand with the growing population? Well, that's exactly my point. We can't. Yeah. Going yeah. forward with the climate change and everything else, and uh, uh, never mind uh, what the governments are doing with uh, <laughs> green uh, movements and everything. No, we can't keep up. I can't well, see let's it.